Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shaw Price Lecture in Astronomy. I'm Benjamin Chu, Year 4 student from HKUST, majoring in Global Business and Information Systems, UMC for today. Today, we are very honored to have Professor Roger Blanford, the 2020 Shaw Laureate in Astronomy, to deliver a lecture to us. It's also my pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Cohen, the moderator of today. Professor Andrew Cohen is the director of HKUST Jockey Club Institute for Advanced Study and the Lam Wu Foundation Professor. Professor Wei Shi, president of HKUST, is also here with us. The Shaw Prize is an international award established under the auspices of the late Mr. Run Run Shaw to honor individuals who have achieved distinguished and significant advances in scientific research. It consists of three annual prizes, astronomy, life science and medicine, and mathematical sciences. Each prize carries a monetary award of 1.2 million US dollars. May I first invite Professor Cohen to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Benjamin. Let me extend my warmest welcome to all of you for today's Shaw Prize Lecture in Astronomy delivered by Professor Roger Blanford, the Luke Blossom Professor, Stanford University School of Humanities and Sciences and Professor, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. The Shaw Prize in Astronomy has been awarded 17 times since 2004 to honor individuals who have made outstanding contributions to scientific research in astronomy. Professor Blanford, the winner of the 2020 Shaw Prize in Astronomy, joins a group of the most distinguished astronomers and astrophysicists of our time. Professor Blanford receives the Shaw Prize for his foundational contributions to theoretical astrophysics, especially for his contributions to a fundamental understanding of active galactic nuclei, the formation and collimation of relativistic jets, the energy extraction mechanism from black holes, and the acceleration of particles in shocks and their relevant radiation mechanisms. Today, we are delighted to have Professor Blanford describing how cosmic power illuminates some of the most mysterious objects in the universe. Before I turn to our distinguished speaker, I would like to thank the Shaw Prize for bringing the Shaw Prize lectures to our university each year. These lectures provide an opportunity, especially for young people, to interact with distinguished academics firsthand. I am delighted to see so many students, scholars, and other participants from around the world here with us today. Like all of you, I look forward to hearing from Professor Blanford. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and great pleasure to present Professor Roger Blanford, renowned astrophysicist, and this year's Shaw Laureate in Astronomy. Thank you, Professor Cohen. Professor Blanford will now deliver his lecture. After the lecture, Professor Cohen will host the Q&A session. If you have any questions during the presentation, please drop them down into the Q&A box. Professor Blanford, please. Thank you for your kind introduction. Allow me to begin by once again expressing my gratitude to Sir Run Run Shaw, the Shaw Foundation and my colleagues who supported my nomination for the 2020 Shaw Prize in Astronomy. I feel humbled by the award, especially given the distinction of my predecessors whom I much admire. Thank you. I would like to give a very general talk about the energy in the universe, how it changes and flows, how it accounts for what astronomers like me get to observe, and what it tells us about physics under extreme conditions, unattainable on Earth. I have tried to make my talk accessible to high school students, but to also present some recent ideas for my colleagues. I warn you that I will cover many topics. There is a lot of universe out there. I want to begin with the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. These are familiar from the rainbow, where raindrops separate white light into its constituents, just like Isaac Newton did with a prism. Light is a wave, and like all waves, it has a wavelength, conventionally denoted lambda. Different colors correspond to different wavelengths. Light also has a frequency conventionally denoted nu. The product of these two quantities is the speed of light. It is called c, and it is a million times the speed of sound. Light is actually a wave of electric and magnetic field. 
We call this electromagnetism. The different frequencies make up the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, if we look at the range of frequency we can see with our eyes, it only spans a factor of two. A musician would call this an octave. So let's make a musical analogy. Divide the actual frequencies of light waves by roughly a trillion and imagine that they are sound waves. The spectrum we can see goes one octave up from middle C on the piano. If we go further to the right, to the higher notes, we enter the ultraviolet. If we go further to the left, we enter the infrared. There is more spectrum. Above the ultraviolet, we have X-rays and gamma rays. We are actually more accustomed to thinking about these waves in terms of their constituent particles, which we call photons. They actually have individual energies that are proportional to their frequency. Below the infrared, we have millimeter and radio wavelengths. The whole spectrum takes up 10 pianos, or 70 octaves worth. What is remarkable is that most of this spectrum is accessible to astronomers. There is even more. Astronomers can observe three more types of signal from the universe. Cosmic rays are charged particles, mostly protons, traveling with speed close to that of light, C. They are stopped by regular matter. We say that they are strongly interacting. Neutrinos are particles that can pass right through regular matter with speed even closer to C. We say that they are weakly interacting. And then there are gravitational waves, which were detected indirectly in the 1970s and directly just six years ago. And these travel at the same speed as light. All of this should be familiar to a physicist who often says that there are four fundamental forces in physics associated with electromagnetism, with strong forces, with weak forces, and with gravity. So there's 150 octaves out there to explore. Now, there are telescopes all around the world and in orbit, exploring or preparing to explore the universe throughout all of these spectra. Here are some examples that I've chosen that are all Chinese. Now I want to change topic a bit. Here is a picture on the right-hand side of the place where Isaac Newton was born and then developed his formalism for, for calculus. There you see Newton, and you can perhaps get a clue about this because you can see the integral signs carved into the wall of, the, of, his, of, this, of this manor called Woolstall. Actually, that's a very cruel joke because his bitter rival, Leibniz, was the person who introduced the integral sign. However, I was actually born five miles away from this manor, and I boast about this to my students. They are not impressed. Now, Newton and his apocryphal apple here on the left-hand side said that a gravitational force pulled an apple to the ground. And he argued that a similar force caused the Earth to orbit the sun. Here we see on a, uh, on a banknote, a United Kingdom banknote, uh, the orbit of the Earth around the sun, and the designers helpfully put the sun at the center of that ellipse, which of course is a mistake, as any physicist will know. Now, if we consider this the way the Leibniz thought about this, he introduced a notion called, a quantity called vis viva, which today we will call kinetic energy. It's equal to half the mass, say of an apple, times the square of its speed. And this is an example of energy. Energy has size, but no direction. Now, there are many forms of energy. We say that the apple in the tree has gravitational energy, and when it falls, it loses this gravitational energy, but gains kinetic energy in just such a way that the sum of the two is constant. We say that energy is conserved. So the energy, the total energy, is the gravitational energy plus the kinetic energy, and that is constant. 
If we roll a ball down a hill, it gets less kinetic energy than we might expect. This is because it spins and also gains rotational energy. When we include this rotational energy, the total energy is again conserved. Much of the history of physics has involved finding new ways to conserve energy. If we roll a ball on a flat but rough table, it will slow and lose its kinetic energy, while there is no change in the gravitational energy. However, the ball and the table will heat up a bit. In other words, they will gain thermal energy. Once more, the total energy, in this case the sum of the kinetic and the thermal energy, will be conserved. Electric and magnetic fields can cause charges and magnets to change their kinetic energy. This introduces electromagnetic energy. And when we include it, energy is again conserved. Light and other waves in the electromagnetic spectrum also have energy. So when the sun shines, it loses energy that is carried off by these electromagnetic waves of light. Some of this light may be in intercepted on a solar panel and converted into another form of electromagnetic energy, and that is solar power. Next, make a simple circuit with a battery, some wires, and a light bulb. When we turn the switch, the light will shine, creating thermal and electromagnetic energy. This comes from a loss of chemical energy, the energy of atoms, inside the battery. You can also find chemical energy in dynamite and a candy bar. Actually, you get more energy per unit mass from a candy bar. However you do it, the kinetic energy and the thermal energy and the chemical energy and all the other forms of energy, when you add them all up, they will be conserved. Now, when the sun shines or radiates and loses energy, it can tap into its thermal and gravitational energy. However, there's not enough of this to keep the sun shining for its age of four and a half billion years. There must be another source of energy. What happens is that the hydrogen in its core is hot enough for it to release energy by changing into helium. This creates heat and those weak particles we just introduced, called neutrinos. This is nuclear power, and it also conserves energy. We have identified seven forms of energy. Gravitational energy, kinetic energy, rotational energy, thermal energy, electromagnetic energy, chemical energy, and nuclear energy. They are all important in our view of the cosmos. Actually, each of them is represented on the sun which we now understand extremely well. At this point, I would like to introduce a second analogy. Think of the universe as a bank, which can change money from one currency to another. From the Hong Kong dollar to the British pound. However, unlike my bank, HSBC, the bank of the universe does not charge commission and the exchange rates do not fluctuate. In fact, energy conservation checked out so well in the sun that we are able to predict and verify all of the modes of oscillation of the sun, and we were able to anticipate the fact that neutrinos had mass and, were a, and can change from one form to another. So this is the power of understanding the conservation of energy. Let us try and put this into a bit of more context by using our earthly predicament. There are roughly 8 billion people on the planet. If we measure energy in terms of joules, then on average, each one of us uses 2,000 joules every second. A more familiar way to say this is that we use a power of 2 kilowatts. And so, in order to sustain us, 
we need to supply a power of a total of 16 trillion watts. This is roughly equally for manufacturing, for transport and domestic use. Now right now most of this is supplied by oil, coal and gas, which are causing climate change. Much effort is therefore being devoted to replacing these by nuclear, hydroelectric, solar, wind, wave, etc. powers. We can relate this to astronomy. Go from the people power to the solar power, which is 4 times 10 to the 26, using exponential notation, watts. Large galaxies can radiate 10 to the 37 watts. The mighty quasars, which you've surely heard of, can be as powerful as a thousand of those galaxies. An object that I will finish this lecture with, called the gamma ray burst, can produce 10 to the 45 watts. And the most powerful thing we know about in the universe is two black holes that merge together, creating gravitational waves, and that produces about 10 to the 49 watts. The universe is a very powerful place. I now want to make another leap into the physics of Albert Einstein. Relativity. This introduces two big conceptual changes. Firstly, there is the inclusion of the so-called rest mass of a body in its energy, which we'll call E. This leads into what is said to be the most famous equation in physics, E equals mc squared. The nuclear reactions in the sun and elsewhere respect this relation. Second, space and time are no longer separate entities, but combine together in space-time. Furthermore, in the presence of gravity, the geometry of space-time becomes curved. This is a generalization of replacing a local map on a flat piece of paper with one covering the entire Earth. It also allows us to do away with gravitational force. What we say in relativity is that a planet, a star or a galaxy will simply keep following a straight line in a curved space-time, just taking one step at a time. This is just like an airplane following a great circle on the surface of the Earth. Now, conservation of energy, in the language of, of relativity, is a feature of the theory. So when the Earth orbits the Sun, its relativistic energy com combines the rest mass and the kinetic energy and the gravitational energy all in one general form of energy, and it is conserved. One of the most important applications of relativity is to cosmology, where it works beautifully. When the expansion of the universe over cosmic time is considered, we find that 95% of the universe today is invisible. Of this, 27% is called dark matter, and 68% is called dark energy. We do not know what dark matter and dark energy are. Maybe they involve more fundamental forces than the four I just mentioned. Now, when we look far away and back in time, at millimeter wavelengths, to when the universe was less than half a million years old, we see a basically featureless background with a temperature less than 1% of the temperature in this room. This is hardly a promising start for astronomy. However, when we map the most distant sky in detail, we, we see that there are tiny features at the level of 10 parts per million, shown here from the Planck satellite. These indicate a range of fluctuations in the density of dark matter and the accompanying 5% of regular matter. Gravity causes them to become relatively larger with time. The smallest of these fluctuations become galaxies, which merge and grow. The dark matter is, of course, invisible. However, the gas made of regular matter will convert its gravitational energy 
into thermal energy and then it can radiate and the radiation will escape. This allows the gas to lose more gravitational energy and to become denser and eventually it can form stars. When stars like the Sun form, they will shine through their nuclear reactions. On the left we see what the sky actually looks like, it's teeming with lots of galaxies nowadays. And then here are some stars, and if we look at the massive stars, then they will, uh, a typical massive star will live fast and die young. And in millions of years, it will run out of its nuclear fuel and gravity will cause it to collapse more and more. Although we may not understand the details very well, it, many re nuclear reactions will take place and make many neutrinos. And the density is so high that the neutrinos will be partly trapped and will drive the outer parts of the star, star away in a giant explosion. We call this a supernova. We've even been able to detect the neutrinos from a nearby supernova. Now after this supernova explosion happens, there are three possible relics that can be left behind. The first is a neutron star, the second is a black hole, and the third is nothing at all. But what is also left behind is this giant explosion, which we call a supernova remnant. So these massive stars explode and they make neutron stars and black holes and also the supernova remnants. A neutron star can be considered as a giant atomic nucleus containing 10 to the 57 nucleons, just like the Sun. Its radius is therefore the cube root of 10 to the 57 times the size of a nucleon. This works out to be 10 kilometers. The escape free from its surface is about a third the speed of light, making it a relativistic object. Now these neutron stars were first recognized in 1967 as pulsars. They were discovered by Jocelyn Bell and Tony Hewish, and here is the signal that they saw. This means that what, what happens is that they saw radio waves that were pulsing, in that, in that case, with a period of about one second, and it went tick, tick, tick in their radio telescopes. And they it eventually identified these with spinning neutron stars. The periods, rotation periods of these neutron stars can range from about 1.5 milliseconds to 30 seconds. So in the fastest neutron stars, we say that there are 700 neutron star days in just one of our seconds. Now, we now know of thousands of these pulsars, and some of them are extremely accurate clocks. They have turned out to be remarkable tools for learning about astronomy, cosmology, and fundamental physics. We can now test general relativity using pulsars at the level of 10 parts per million. They also exhibit energetic pathways. When a neutron star forms in a supernova explosion, some of the gravitational energy gets channeled into rotational energy, and some of it is taken up as magnetic energy. A typical pulsar has a magnetic field strength of roughly 100 megatesla. That's over a trillion times the Earth's magnetic field strength. We can think of the pulsar as an inclined spinning magnet. A graphic version of this model was provided by the famous Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula was a supernova explosion observed almost exclusively by Chinese astronomers 966 years ago. It contains a central pulsar with a 33 millisecond period. And we can calculate the rate of loss of rotational energy by the pulsar. And we find this balances the energy that is radiated by the surrounding nebula. And it's nearly 100,000 times 
the power of the sun. So what we have here is an energy pathway where rotational energy goes, because of the spinning magnet, into electromagnetic energy, which then goes into radiation from the Crab Nebula. Now I've told you the regular pulsars have magnetic fields, roughly 100 megatesla. This is far more than can ever be sustained on Earth. However, we now know that some neutron stars are formed with magnetic fields a thousand times larger, typically 100 gigatesla. These are called magnetars. The, field the magnetic fields on magnetars are so strong that quantum mechanical effects dominate their behavior in quite fascinating ways. Astronomers first found them through their gamma ray flares, which were so intense that one of them actually rattled our atmosphere. They are now associated with a new observational phenomenon, these magnetars, and these are called fast radio bursts. These are bursts of radio emission, just short millisecond bursts of radio emission that can be seen across the universe. We think that they are powered by magnetic energy and not rotational energy like the regular pulsars. And the magnetic energy is released as a magnetic field on the surface of the uh, neutron star is twisted just like the magnetic field seen here and observed on the surface of the sun. It becomes unstable like twisting a string and that then sends a big pulse of gamma rays and radio waves right across the universe. So here we have an energy pathway where magnetic energy is going pretty much directly into radiation, no rotational energy. The other type of stellar remnant I mentioned is a black hole. As I'm sure you all know, a black hole is surrounded by an event horizon from behind which not even light can escape. Astrophysical black holes are characterized by their mass and their spin. In this sense, they are elementary particles. The radius of the event horizon decreases from, given a formula here, 2 gm over c squared to gm over c squared as their spin increases from zero to the maximum value allowed. Black holes were recognized in the 1970s when X-ray astronomers observed binary stars in, the in our galaxy. In this case, as shown on the right-hand side of this slide, a regular star supplies gas so as to form a disk around the black hole called an accretion disk. Note that as shown in this cartoon here, these accretion disks can also make a pair of perpendicular features to the accretion disk called a jet. And I'll say a bit more about that later. These jets contain gas moving away from the disk close to the speed of light. Now, if I turn back to the accretion disk, gas spirals inwards under friction. And, the fric and it loses gravitational energy as it goes and creates thermal energy. The way this friction works is that it's, there are magnetic fields that are um, causing one ring of gas to rub against the other ring of gas and to create heat. And so magnetic energy is a sort of intermediary between the gravitational energy and the thermal energy, and then eventually that thermal energy becomes ra is radiated away as X-rays by which they were first discovered. Before I go on, I need to, need to make a very important physics point. As we have described, Astronomers observe the universe using all four types of signal, electromagnetic, cosmic ray, neutrino, and gravitational. And we try to make sense of what we see. It is instructive to consider the efficiency with which energy of regular matter can be converted into these four types of signal. For illustration, consider supplying the people power on Earth in the top left-hand corner for just one second. If we were going to do this, we would need on Earth roughly a million kilograms of the chemical energy of coal, gas, 
or an oil, for example. If we used a nuclear reactor, we would use about, need about 100 grams of uranium. But if we had a black hole, we would need only a third of a gram of anything if we could release all that gravitational energy. Of course, we do not have this option, but this does indicate what, why relativistic objects are such powerful cosmic sources. Now let's turn to the third consequence of a supernova explosion. It's called the supernova remnant. We've already seen one example, the Crab Nebula. A more typical example is Cassiopeia A. Typically, one sees a ring of gas expanding away from the site of the supernova explosion at a few percent of the speed of light. In fact, if you look carefully at this picture, you can see a small dot at the center, and that is the neutron star that was left behind. Now, the energy of this explosion is mostly kinetic energy. However, it will eventually be stopped by the surrounding gas. And the way this happens is by forming a shock front. As gas passes through the shock front, it's heated. Its kinetic energy is changed into thermal energy. And it can then radiate x-rays, as we see in this picture here. So what we have here is the kinetic energy of the expanding gas is converted into thermal energy and then into radiation. At a shock front, we have gas approaching at, uh, on, from one side at a high speed and leaving on the other side at a lower speed. It turns out that the gas also carries magnetic field, which can scatter high-energy particles. And the scatterers are approaching each other across the shock front. And if we imagine a cosmic ray proton crossing the shock front many times, each time it does so, it can be batted, uh, by, batted by these um, approaching scatterers on either side, and it will gain energy. It looks like about 10% of the energy from the supernova remnants goes into accelerating the cosmic rays we observe on Earth. Uh, we can account lower energy cosmic rays with energies as high as about 100 times the energy you see at a, at a particle accelerator, like a Large Hadron Collider. We can account for those by these supernova remnants like Cassiopeia A, which I've just shown you. And so this is how we get kinetic energy essentially converted into um, cosmic ray energy, and we can observe this at Earth. But that is not all. If we looked at all the cosmic rays that we see, we see energies up to 10 million times the energy that can come from these supernova remnants like Cassiopeia A. It looks like larger shock fronts associated with galaxies and the even larger ones associated with clusters of galaxies can accelerate the very highest energy cosmic rays. And the very highest energy cosmic rays have energies of about 100 joules, which is about the energy of a well-hit tennis ball. So that you can see those bats hitting a ball backwards and forwards on that cartoon there. It's not, not a silly uh, illustration because the energy of, of, the, of the tennis ball is about the energy of the very highest energy cosmic rays we know about. Now I explained that when a galaxy forms, the collapsing and cooling gas makes stars. However, some of the gas can also continue right down to the center of the galaxy without forming stars. There it can make stars in a very much more concentrated region, and typically these are bright and very massive stars. And it can also make a black hole, a massive black hole with a mass between 1 million and 10 billion times the mass of the Sun. This is the foundation of an active galactic nucleus. When the black hole is fed with gas, it can form an accretion disk, just like a black hole in a binary star. It will behave in much the same way. 
However, the power can be as much as a billion times greater than with a stellar black hole. These are the powerful quasars. So the quasar power can exceed a thousand galaxies and it is truly remarkable that the biggest black holes are only about smaller than the size of the solar system and yet it can create as much power to outshine a thousand galaxies. Now, we focused on black holes as operating through their gravitational energy. However, they have a second channel, and that is their rotational energy. Remember I said that there were two characteristics of a black hole? There was the mass and the spin. And this spin has an energy that can be extracted. Many quasars, like the one shown here called 3C279, also have powerful jets. And we now believe that those powerful jets are actually powered not by gravitational energy, but by the spin energy of the black hole. It acts in some sense like a giant flywheel, and the energy is tapped using large-scale electromagnetic field, as shown in these simulations on the right-hand side. The jets themselves can also be powerful neutrino sources and gamma ray sources, and they can vary on time scales as short as a few minutes, showing how concentrated the power source must be. A very famous example of these jets was studied in the nearby galaxy M87, and this was famously imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. In this case, a ring of emitting gas orbits a six billion solar mass black hole, and it was imaged using millimeter telescopes. The spinning black hole is thought to power the jets. However, most astronomers think the orbiting ring is powered by gravitational energy of infalling gas. By contrast, I have argued that it too, like the jets, is powered by black hole spin. We will see. This is the famous shadow of the black hole shown there on the right hand side. And now let me conclude by returning to the gamma ray bursts, which I said were the most powerful type of stellar source. There are actually two types of gamma ray bursts. The first of these is formed in a minority of supernova explosions that appears to make spinning black holes and powerful jets that can push their way out through the collapsing star. These sources are extremely powerful for up to a minute or so. The second type of gamma ray burst seems to involve a pair of merging neutron stars and they have been observed in full multi-messenger style by gravitational wave observatories. These can also make jets. They also make a large fraction of the heavy elements in the universe. It is a strong, though unproven, conjecture that these two are powered by black hole spin. It's time to wrap up. I've showed you how astronomers are able to discover so much about the universe using signals or messengers involving all four of the fundamental forces of physics, over 150 octaves of total spectrum. I've also explained that the bank of universe can change energy from one currency to another. It can give out big loans, which in the case of black holes cannot be repaid. I hope that in this broad summary, I've been able to convey how much we have learned about how the universe works and how much more we can expect to learn in the near future. I also hope that you will appreciate just how interconnected all of this is. I would like to conclude with an acknowledgement. I've been truly privileged to work in astronomy over the past 50 years. On the way, I've had the loving support of my family and the pleasure of collaborating with so many teachers, students, and colleagues. I hope this montage can express my gratitude to all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Blanford, for the enlightening lecture. We will now open the floor for questions. If you have any question for Professor Blanford, please type it in the Q&A box. 
our moderator will read your questions out and facilitate at this session. Okay, thank you, Benjamin, and thanks, Roger, for that wonderful talk. So we are receiving uh, some questions. I just want to remind uh, audience members, by all means, Roger has generously agreed to chat with us and answer all questions. So uh, please type them into the box, and as they come in, I'll just read them out and uh, we'll hear Roger's thoughts. So let me start with the first question that's just popped up, uh, which uh, is quite a general one, but given the large energies involved in many of these astrophysical objects, is there any possibility that someday humans might be able to harness them uh, and use the energy for practical purposes? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, we already are, of course. I mean, if we take uh, nuclear reactions, which we see going on in stars, for example, we have nuclear reactors on Earth. So in some sense, we are doing that. If we take solar power, we are harnessing the, the power of the sun. The more exotic things like making a black hole and using that, I leave for future generations. I don't know how to do it. Uh, very interesting. Another question. So can you elaborate on how jets uh, arise uh, from uh, black holes? I can try to do that. Uh, I have to say that this is a subject on which there has been much conjecture, and but we are learning an awful lot now. Uh, from observations like that made by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, uh, whose shadow of a black hole was famously uh, publicized, and I, show, I showed it as, as that orange uh, ring that we saw associated with the galaxy, M87. So observations of that general type are teaching us a lot. And I, I would summarize what we've learned most recently is that these jets are made, if not by the black hole itself, very close to uh, the black hole and perhaps in the gas surrounding it. My own view, and I think there's, this is probably the majority opinion, my own view is that the actual power source is the rotational or spin energy of the black hole. And it is extracted or tapped by magnetic fields. So what we have is magnetic field lines that thread the surface of the black hole in much the same way that magnetic field lines thread the surface of the Earth. And in the, in the case of the black hole, they are able to take out a lot of power. Now, that doesn't necessarily make a jet, but if you add into that the strange property of magnetic field lines, then not only do they push outwards, but they also have a tension, like a, a rubber band, like a piece of elastic. And when those magnetic field lines get wrapped around this power that has been extracted from the black hole, then they tend to focus it down into a jet. And that's how we get those two linear features that we see in so many sources. Uh, thank you. Uh, wow, we're getting quite a lot of good questions here. One of our audience members would like to understand, you mentioned that uh, black holes spin, but there is a maximum spin. So why is that? Why can't the black hole spin faster? Um, I think that there are several ways of thinking about this. It's a little bit like saying, why can't a uh, a, a particle uh, travel faster than the speed of light. In principle, if we wanted to go through that barrier and ask a particle to go faster than the speed of light, we keep on adding more and more energy to it and to get closer and closer to the speed of light, but it wouldn't be, we wouldn't, with finite energy, we wouldn't be able to make it go faster than the speed of light. It's a little bit the same with a black hole. If I have a sort of modestly spinning black hole and I throw rocks into it in the right direction, it will get faster. But then if I try and spin it up more and more, um, it takes however, however many rocks I throw at it, it is going to just get closer and closer to its maximal spin rate. So taking it to this uh, stage is, in fact, um, as far as you can go now. Some people have speculated that there might exist particles traveling the speed of light. They call those tachyons. Um, uh, some people say there may be black holes uh, that uh, spin faster than that maximal speed. If, they, if, if there are such things, there is no evidence that we've seen them in any place. 
and I personally doubt that they, they even exist, um, but you can't transition from what we have at the moment to that state. Uh, thank you. So here is, a, I think, a, quite an interesting uh, leading question for you. Uh, uh, how bright should an energetic source be to illuminate the dark matter for us? Is there any hope to discover such sources? Again, that's a, a very interesting question. Of course, dark matter, just to back up a little bit for, for the audience, is most of the matter, five, six or so of the matter in the universe. And uh, as astronomers, uh, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves because neither the dark matter nor the dark energy, which together make 95% of the current universe, neither of those can we put our finger on what they actually are. And as you might expect, an awful lot of effort and thought uh, is going into trying to answer that question. Now, uh, what we do know about dark matter is that to a very good approximation, it only interacts uh, with, uh, through its gravitational force. And, uh, and it's also what we call cold. That is to say, it doesn't really have any pressure, at least when it's first formed. And so uh, this um, very simple description of dark matter is, um, suffices to make those microwave background maps I showed, the fluctuations in the microwave background, it suffices to explain that in exquisite detail. So it's a very simple description and you get so much out of it and, and the observations are in complete concurrence with it. Now, having said that, the, the thing to a very good approximation, it only interacts with its gravitational force, admits the possibility that, like neutrinos, it might have very weak interactions with you and I, with, uh, with light, uh, with, um, uh, other, with itself, and with, uh, with other, forms of, other forms of matter. And these have been sought. Uh, people have looked for dark matter interacting with um, regular matter in a variety of ways, both remotely to astronomical observations and also in experiments here on Earth. And so far, all we have is exquisite upper limits on, on those interactions. Uh, there's another way in which you say, how will it interact with, uh, with light? Um, then there is a a very good way that it interacts with light. And that is if I just have a great big concentration of dark matter, say a cluster of galaxies, for example, which is mostly dark matter in terms of its mass, then light from a background source will be deflected. So the gravitational force of that uh, cluster of galaxies will cause the ray of light to be deflected. Actually, it's deflected a little bit more than that because as I mentioned in the lecture, space-time is curved, and that sort of curvature actually doubles the effect that you might, that Isaac Newton might have calculated. And, but we, light is deflected, so light, a, lot, a ray of light going on one side of the cluster of galaxies uh, will be bent towards us, and a ray of light going on the other side of the cluster of galaxies can be bent towards us. And we can see more than one image of a background source. So that is an example of light interacting with dark matter, but only through its curved space-time or gravitational force, depending on whether you prefer Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein. Very interesting, thank you. So timely question, uh, as I'm sure you know, the uh, Lasso Observatory in Tibet has recently announced the discovery of some of the highest energy gamma rays uh, we've ever seen. Do you have any thoughts about the origin of these high energy gammas and uh, what the implications might be? Uh, yes. Um, if, well, let, let me say that what, one of the exciting uh, events of my life was actually visiting the Lasso Observatory a couple of years ago. And it's a truly remarkable part of the world, as well as a, a, a fantastic accomplishment to build it there. And I'm not in the least surprised that it's starting to make very interesting scientific discoveries. Going to these very highest energy um, uh, gamma rays uh, is one of the frontiers of astronomy right now. We're seeing these um, uh, in, in gamma rays. We're also at the frontier in some sense with neutrinos, looking at what are called PEV neutrinos. 
And then with the cosmic rays, those were, those were three of my four channels, if you like, going to uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays, which, as I said, had the, the energy of a, as a, could be as high as a well hit tennis ball. So those are three of the frontiers. And Lasso is um, is uh, is pushing, pushing the envelope there, is pushing the frontier forward. And these particular sources, they're sometimes they have the name Pevatrons. And uh, my, my own guess is that what is happening there is that it is a sort of supercharged version of the um, shock fronts that I said were associated with supernova remnants that is accelerating particles to the various high energies that they can make. And then those in turn are making gamma rays. So uh, I'm seeing quite a few questions regarding black holes. So why don't we switch gears a little bit and uh, start with uh, the simplest question. Uh, what actually do you think happens inside a black hole? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, let me say something about black holes. The ones I've been discussing here are astronomers' black holes. They're uh, geometry, if you like, and the basis of their physics is rooted in a description of, a sol of their space-time, let's say an exact mathematical solution of Albert Einstein's equations of general relativity. This is known as the Kerr metric after Roy Kerr, who in 1963, in a remarkable feat of mathematics, found this solution. At that time, it was a remarkable solution. But one of the things we've come to appreciate, uh, in fact, it was appreciated very soon afterwards, that not only was it a solution, it was as far as black holes are concerned, it was the solution. And what it, what it contains is just a mass, which is a scale, just tells you how big the black hole is, whether it's a stellar black hole or a massive black hole. And uh, in addition, it contains a spin, which tells you how much rotational energy it has. If the spin is zero, there is no rotational energy. If the spin is up to its maximal value, there's about 30% of its E equals MC squared mass that is present in spin energy. And it is there for the taking to make jets and, other, other, and produce other observable effects. So those are the ast astronomers' black holes. Those are the big ones. Now, if you go down to uh, much smaller scales, you're entering the realm of theoretical physics and the th febrile imaginations of theoretical physicists have had a wonderful time thinking about these black holes and in particular, how they interface with quantum mechanics. And if one asks questions like what happens inside a black hole, eventually one has to wrestle with those quantum mechanics problems. They're very much at the end, end of the story in a big black hole like uh, that is associated with a star or a galaxy, but in a very small black hole, which you can imagine, and which may indeed exist in the universe, and at the very smallest level, they almost something like this almost certainly must happen, then quantum mechanics becomes part of the story as well in a very uh, highly entangled way. And the truth of the matter is, in spite of enormous effort and enormous progress, we still do not have a working theory of quantum gravity that can give you a full answer to that question. So all I can do is, is tell you a story about what happens in the realm of classical physics. And basically, in the, in the realm of classical physics, if uh, you or I were to take uh, a journey across the event horizon of a black hole, if it were a very big black hole, in principle, we could survive that transition. Nothing special would happen at the event horizon. It wouldn't be any special place. It would just be a point of no return. There was no going back after that. But then afterwards, in that case, in the time scale of less than a day, um, what we, we would proceed inexorably uh, under conditions of stronger and stronger gravity, the tidal forces acting on us would become stronger and stronger. Our arms would be ripped from our bodies. Our legs would be ripped from our bodies. Our, um, um, our molecules would be ripped apart. Our atoms would be ripped apart. Our fundamental particles would be ripped apart and so on. Uh, at this point, it'd be rather uncomfortable, but then we get to uh, the place where it's called a singularity. 
which is Roger Penrose, the recent Nobel laureate, showed is essentially an, an inevitable consequence of this. And their time, in some sense, comes to an end. The forces become, from a classical point of view, uh, boundless. And quantum mechanics must come in to complete that story. And neither I nor any, anyone else, as far as I know, uh, knows how to tell the end of that story. Uh, so uh, I am told that we are uh, approaching the end of the questions, but I know Roger has generously agreed to continue. So I think we have time for perhaps one last question. Uh, gravitational wave astronomy has recently opened a new window into these exotic objects in the universe. Uh, can you chat a little bit about how the future of gravitational wave astronomy is likely to play out and influence our understanding of some of these uh, objects? Certainly, I'd be uh, uh, very happy to do that. The, um, of course, it was one of the exciting uh, discoveries, um, rewarded by another Nobel Prize in, in 2015, um, that uh, there was the discovery of the first direct detection of gravitational waves from, in that case, two uh, stellar black holes make, merging together and creating this set of this, this short wave train, which was detected on Earth by, observe, by uh, observation. And um, uh, the, uh, this technique using uh, originally a telescope called LIGO, an observatory called LIGO, and now using Virgo and other, other telescopes as well. And there's a Chinese, Chinese program here as well. Uh, these um, techniques are now finding many, many sources, and when they go back on the air again, they will find more and they will push out to greater distances. So that part of the spectrum is, I think, you, you know it's secure, you know you're going to find more. Now, the other parts of the spectrum are ones where there are big efforts to try and develop the observing capability. And we're here talking about mainly about going to uh, longer wavelengths and lower frequencies. One of these techniques involves going into space and the program for doing that looks, looks like a 10 year timescale. Um, there are uh, pr a program to do and into sort of a lower frequency, but in, in between these, the space one, if you like, and the, um, and the LIGO range, and that uses so-called atom interferometry. That's an exciting possibility, but very much a work in progress. And if we go to very long um, uh, wavelengths with periods of order a year or so, they're there, the, the detectors are not uh, directly on Earth, they're in fact these pulsars. I mentioned the spinning magnetized neutron stars called pulsars, and those are wonderful clocks. And if a gravitational wave passes by a set of pulsars, which is such splendid clocks, then we can in principle detect it. That technique has been honed over the last 15 years, and we do in fact expect sources of those gravitational waves particularly from not just one black hole, but two black holes in the nucleus of a distant galaxy orbiting each other, just like those two stellar mass black holes that LIGO found. And so there should be lots and lots of these sources out there. And um, the combined signal that we expect is pretty close to what it can now be measured by um, by this technique of using pulsars and observing them with radio telescopes. It, it hasn't been uh, detected yet, but it is clear that they're on, on the point of either being able to see this background of ra uh, gravitational radiation or set astrophysically interesting limits upon it. And there are sort of uh, exciting um, possibilities in, in the data, but you know we're all pretty careful and nobody wants to make a false claim. And I think we just need, you know, more, a little more sensitivity and more data collecting before you're going to be at the point where you can either say we've got enough for limit or detection. But what's significant is by honing these techniques, the radio astronomers have got to the point where they're on the threshold of being able to see something that one might reasonably expect should be there. 
So that's an exciting thing. And then the final technique is, is again, is, is, a, is really cosmology. And this is looking at extremely long wavelength gravitational waves. And these derive possibly from the early universe, the theory of inflation and so on in the early universe predicts these very long wavelength gravitational waves. And um, they have a telltale signature in the microwave background and people are trying very hard to measure it. Um, as yet, they don't have a, a detection, but again, there are telescopes out there that have the sensitivity to get into the range where a reasonable, it's reasonable to expect there might be a signal. And of course, so watch, watch this space for the next decade or so, and maybe I don't know which of those techniques is going to be the first to make a new detection of gravitational radiation, but I, I'm an optimist and I expect one of them will. Great. So I think that all of us can really look forward to a new era in multi-messenger astronomy and new uh, windows opened up by gravitational waves. Uh, I've been informed that uh, sadly we are running out of time. So first, let me just express my personal thanks to Roger and all the participants uh, for generating a lot of interesting uh, questions. And I say that I think all of us uh, hope that at some time in the not too distant future, we'll be able to welcome Roger in person in Hong Kong. So thank you, Roger. And let me turn it back over to Benjamin. Thank you, Professor Blanford and Professor Cohen. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. This lecture is now over. Thanks again for joining us today. 